yesterday we were talking about building homes. So <laughs> lost track of time. All right, well, welcome to deploying OpenShift on Dell's OpenStack cloud reference architecture. My name is Grant Shipley. I'm a manager of OpenShift at Red Hat. I'm going to start the presentation with just a little bit of overview of OpenShift and then turn it over to, to Judd, who works at, at Dell, and he'll walk you through um, how they're actually doing it. Um, but first, you know, why is OpenShift important, right? And we have been living in a unique time over the last 10 to 20 years to where the world is completely changing, right? This is a picture from 2005. Uh, I believe it was the Pope making a visit to a group of people. And they all came out to, to view this event, right? And there's one little, I think that's probably a Motorola flip phone. Um, in the crowd, right? And so this was pretty much what we saw just 10 years ago. In 2013, the Pope made the same visit. And this is how the audience has changed. And you guys have probably seen this if you go to concerts or to even your kids' soccer games. People live through the lens of their phones now. They, they record, record everything. And so we're going through this digital disruption to where traditional enterprises are being completely disrupted by these small players, this, this internet age that we've been living in the last 10 to 20 years, right? And you guys have probably seen this on Twitter, but just how the world has changed recently. You know, the largest taxi service company in the world doesn't actually own any taxis, right? It's Uber. The world's largest media company doesn't create or own any content, and that's Facebook. The world's most valuable retailer, Alibaba, doesn't actually have any inventory. They just you know, recently let people sell on their site. The largest accommodation provider, Airbnb, doesn't actually own any real estate. And so these traditional huge companies, like taxi companies, um, I saw a presentation earlier today to where the, the fares in New York City for taxis has dropped 60% just in the last couple of years. The price of a medallion in San Francisco has dropped. I think that maybe that was in the keynote this morning. Is that, is that where we saw that? And so, you know, the, the internet and, and this fast speed to market from small companies are disrupting everything. Anyone can compete in this age with cloud computing. But out of all of this disruption, you know, clarity emerges. You have to be able to compete, even if you're a large enterprise. You have to be able to compete with the small companies. That's kind of odd, right? As a large enterprise, you have to be able to compete with the 50 to 100 person companies. And so how do you do that, right? When you're a slow moving enterprise, you need to kind of get some speed under your belt, right? And stop the, the paper pushing all day and be able to deliver faster. And that's what we're seeing with, with cloud computing. And just a trend over the last six months is that containers are going to solve all of this, right? We've all heard about Docker, 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 Docker. We've got to move everything to Docker, right? Well, Docker is just you know, a, a single container format. There's also Rocket. But just having a container-based deployment is not enough, right? Because you need to orchestrate where those containers are actually deployed and living. And so what we see at Red Hat is people you know, developing their own container orchestration systems and deciding where to place these containers inside of their data centers. And their container and their data center infrastructure kind of looks like this at the end of the day. They've, you know, checkbox, I've deployed all my containers, but they're not really in a state where they can be managed by the operations team. And as this continues, their infrastructure begins to tip over, right? Because they can't maintain these containers anymore. And so with OpenShift, you know, we work closely with Google on the Kubernetes project where we can deliver these containers in a more streamlined fashion and orchestrate them across the nodes in your environment to where at the end of the day, your data center will look more like this, right? Very, very sane environment, easily maintainable, right? So we've talked about containers and, you know, the need to have some type of, you know, enterprise class orchestration system that will help you determine where those lives, but that's still not enough, right? Just if you have these containers out there, they're going to probably end up looking like this. You haven't achieved anything differently than we did with virtualization 20 years ago, right? 
um, the operations team, if you're a developer, and you guys are probably more on the sysadmin side, you give these virtual machines out to developers, but, but you don't know if they're actually being used, right? And they sit around forever and ever, and you have to, to try to reclaim those at some point. And so, sure, you can deploy containers out with, with Docker and Kubernetes, but what we want to do is make them useful, right? We want developers to be able to take these containers that are deployed to the nodes in your infrastructure and do something great with them. And here's my personal favorite, just because it's a bar made out of a container. Right? And so, so what do we do with OpenShift on top of just Docker and Kubernetes? Right? And you know, that it's the whole experience for the developers and sysadmins, the value add we bring on top of that. And what we're here today for is to talk about um, the deployment of OpenShift v3 on Dell's reference OpenStack architecture. And that was made possible through this project we have called OpenShift Commons. Has anyone heard of OpenShift Commons? A few people, probably the people raising their hands belong to it. Um, but what OpenShift Commons is, is it's a true open source community um, for all people who use or operate OpenShift PaaS environments can get together and collaborate. We don't charge to join this. Um, and the only ask is that if you want to join OpenShift Commons, that you have an interest in OpenShift and want to work with and collaborate with other companies on the, uh, on the OpenShift platform and doing interesting things with deployments. We released OpenShift Commons about, I think about two months ago. Today we have just over 75 organizations that have joined the OpenShift Commons. We add roughly one new company a day, okay? And that has not slowed down since we released it. And they're, you know, anywhere from, from startups to, to large companies like Accenture and Dell have joined, right? And again, it is, it's a true open community. We don't charge for it. There's no contributor license agreement or anything like that. There is a LOI, a letter of intent that you have to sign as a company, which just means that you are interested in OpenShift and that you will work to collaborate with other people. And so as part of the OpenShift Commons project, we hold briefings every couple of weeks to where operators of OpenShift can get together and discuss best practices. They're generally in a webinar type format to where you have someone presenting and then people answering and asking questions about it. And you know what's interesting with OpenShift Commons is sometimes we have our own operations team give briefings. OpenShift Online, which is our publicly hosted OpenShift, has, what's the number of apps? It's almost two and a half million apps that's been created on it. We do about a billion requests per day on OpenShift Online, right? And that's the same code that is running in OpenShift Enterprise and OpenShift Origin, which is what we're gonna be looking at today. All right, so any questions about OpenShift Commons or about OpenShift, okay? So just to recap, what we're gonna look at today is the next version of, of OpenShift, and that's what we're talking about, OpenShift V3. And that's where we've replatformed from our existing uh, Linux containers, which was SE Linux, Linux control groups, and PAM namespace based, over to support Docker containers. Okay. We have also created a new utility called STI, or source to image, because we believe as developers, and that's what I am, that developers want to take advantage of Docker containers and get them deployed to, to OpenStack, but they don't necessarily want to know the ins and outs of how to create containers. They don't really want to know how to create Docker files and, and specify things. They want to write software and to deploy it. So what we allow with source to image is you can take an existing Git repository written in any language, basically, and you can deploy that to OpenShift. And we will take the source code and build a Docker image under the covers and then orchestrate that out with Kubernetes. We also will allow the running and provisioning of any existing Docker image out there, right? So we're, we'll be fully uh, Docker API ready to go, right? But it is just a container API. 
And so when you know, our most important thing with OpenShift is that you're never locked in to any vendor, right? So we don't have any proprietary hooks or anything like that. And so if the, the industry starts moving more towards Rocket or something like that, our container API will, will allow us to support that as well. Um, but we're going to come out of the gate with uh, Docker support. So when is all this coming? It'll be GA'd next month. If you want to count down to it, you can go to openshift.com. We have a little counter on the bottom of when it'll be GA'd. If you are in the Commons uh, community, you have you know, access to that early. It's also fully open source. Um, so you, you can run this today without you know, being a member of the community. The open source project is called Origin. You can get to it at openshift.github.io. All right, so let's switch over to Judd. And I promised him I would take 15 minutes, and I've taken 10 minutes. So he's probably going to get angry with me, which means more time for Q&As. So I, I do want to thank Judd for uh, coming out and talking about OpenShift today on, on their uh, reference architecture. everybody. Oh, cool. And I can see the next slide. Um, how many folks have done uh, an OpenStack deployment? OK, half the room. A little more than half the room. Cool. Uh, how many have done it um, and ordered all the right gear the first time? <laughs> and all the right switches, your top of rack switches, your, um, yeah. Well, we put in a lot of effort over the past year working with Red Hat um, to uh, create a reference architecture that will meet most of the use cases that we've seen in the field um, in order to get you running up, up and running really quickly uh, with just enough automation and just enough flexibility uh, so you can really take OpenStack out of the gate and start doing interesting things with it. Um, my team at Dell, fortunately, we're a hardware provider, so we got lots of gear. And we get to play around with a lot of gear. Um, and I'll be getting to some of the specifics of the gear that we've, we've chosen and we've been testing, uh, and the gear that I've been deploying OpenShift on top of, on top of OpenStack, and the challenges that we face, and some of the conceptual transformations that have to happen from the normal notion of tenant and project within OpenStack to this new level of multi-tenancy that we get to when we have containerization and uh, a full sort of DevOps mindset where developers are acting, are interacting um, with uh, shared systems. So first, um, what's a PaaS? Uh, in OpenStack land, we're very comfortable, most of us, with infrastructure as a service. Uh, our typical friends of Nova and, and Cinder and Glance and uh, Neutron are all providing infrastructure servers services. Um, what are these platform services? Platform services are basically um, developer tools um, that hide away all the rest of the infrastructure and allow you to deploy code, update code, create a continuous integration pipeline uh, to build your apps, to bring in all the dependencies, to make sure the operating system is configured correctly and the network's configured correctly and the storage is configured correctly to be able to serve your application and then interact with the other networking gear that can detect uh, at what level of utilization um, your entire infrastructure is running and deploy more resources in order to match the, um, the load that you're at and even redeploy resources if uh, the load on the load balancer has gone down, um, especially if you have a spike sales and folks who run um, retail establishments will often have their noontime sales where you'll want a lot of capacity all at once and you want to be able to scale that back. Uh, OpenShift on its own can do that on your bare metal 
we at OpenStack, uh, in the OpenStack conference, love the operational efficiencies of having virtual machines. So much easier to move around workloads, so much easier to divide your customers or your different departments into separate virtual machines and attach them without rolling a crash cart or getting too many people involved to attach to new storage. If suddenly the, your image hosting service is blowing out of the water and you've got too many images or too many orders. Um, we love the virtualized platform the, uh, that the infrastructure as a service gives us. Um, and the integrating of the infrastructure of a service and platform as a service is really the key next step um, to be able to achieve the, the levels of automation and flexibility that take operators out of the line of fire and away from uh, and reduce the incidence of, of downtime or degraded service. Um, in our reference architecture, I love showing pictures of gear. Um, we are recommending uh, the R630 servers for our admins, for the controller nodes, and for the compute nodes. Um, these are uh, just packed with CPU and tons and tons of RAM. Um, I don't have the specs right here. We can get into it. But uh, and uh, two bonded interfaces. Uh, our entire reference architecture is fully HA. Um, for storage, uh, our reference architecture specifies Ceph for object and block storage. Um, so this would be your sort of your beginning um, uh, storage array. And you could also choose, and we will show you how to use um, Dell's Equalogic storage arrays in addition to this if you need a larger and larger storage capacity. Um, we also specify in great detail which, um, uh, which networking gear we're going to be using. Um, for top of rack switches, uh, we're a pair of these 10 gigabit with 40 gigabit uplinks. Um, for inclusive of the compute networks and the storage networks. And just one at the bottom, the one Dell S55 for all of your control black plane. That is all your IPMI traffic. That's definitely stuff you want to keep off of anybody's potential um, uh, attack vectors. IPMI is notoriously um, uh, vulnerable to those sort of attacks. And we also want to make sure that those are available to be able to bring services on and offline. So we spec one Dell S55 to attach to all the BMC IPMI interfaces. Um, and with our tools, uh, you can start and stop gear, bring gear on and offline. Um, if you are a very bursty service and you actually want to, one of the things I really like to do, and my buddies at the Racken company are doing this, um, based on load, you can shut down servers in your infrastructure automatically to save wattage, to save money, to save heating, to save cooling, uh, and be ready to burst um, when you need it. Um, this is what the rack would typically look like. Um, our solution admin host is um, where everything else gets kicked off, where all of OpenStack gets deployed from. Um, and that's 1630. It also houses, if you guys know RHEL's uh, Red Hat's OSP offering. Uh, Foreman is an essential part of deploying this that drives the Puppet modules that deploys OpenStack. Um, three controller nodes, three compute nodes, and three storage nodes. Um, here we start to get into the details of the complexities of uh, uh, a typical OpenStack deployment. And after a few slides of this, we'll get into how laying OpenShift on top of this um, creates a little more complexity, but the wins are very huge. Um, these five networks at the bottom and a third one, a um, uh, third and a fourth up on top, uh, the only ones that your customers would really care about is that middle green one, which is the internal network for tenants. Um, the provisioning LAN, that ugly color green at the top of the stack there, uh, that's your S55 switch, um, allowing the solution admin host um, to switch on and off gear as necessary. Um, any questions so far? No, we've got bonds on, um, on a few of these, especially the, uh, the storage networks. Um, so you'll have uh, bonded. Uh, we're doing AB bonds right now. You can switch them to, to full bonds. Um, 
they'll, they will pick up a good deal of the traffic. Um, I'm focusing in here a little bit on the, uh, the complexity of each of these. Um, the, we specify which NICs you can get, which, uh, and we will set them in the proper order. Uh, so you can really just turn on your gear and start letting the solution admin host install uh, OpenStack for you. Um, but then we put OpenShift on top of OpenStack. Okay, so you've deployed, let's say, a whole bunch of virtual machines. You have one tenant. You have one customer. We're going to be deploying, say, our, um, our friend and retail departments, five or six applications uh, on OpenShift. They've been writing on OpenShift. They're pretty comfortable with it, or they're in a testing environment. What is... What are, what are the parts of OpenShift? The very top, the user experience, that's um, primarily uh, Git, uh, checking in and out code. When you're working with OpenShift, um, you're, making, you're cloning your repository of your code into, um, into OpenShift. So I would even imagine, I've got a slide about this later on, where you have uh, your own Git code repo in one virtual machine, um, perhaps on a separate network, and you're able to, to check out of that into uh, um, push, actually do a git push into, uh, into OpenShift, and OpenShift triggers a build and through your test network by um, potentially pulling down more containers from the Docker Hub and the, the OpenShift marketplace. Um, Kubernetes is, the, is a joint project with Google, um, and it's an open source project that does similar to Nova Network, Nova, um, the Nova Scheduler, when and where um, containers will be deployed. Uh, Docker are those containers and the standardized interface for them, and the container host, which I'm not going to go into now, but you can use Fedora or RHEL. Uh, I haven't tried to deploy them on my, um, uh, on my sort of the, on Debian, which I started with. Um, I'm kind of converted now to, to RHEL and Fedora. Um, these are the names, again, of the, of the great products. Um, I spend most of my life in Git, and I just love pushing code directly to Git. Here is an architectural diagram of how OpenShift is working, as if it's all in one virtual machine. Now, these two larger blue boxes can be split into separate virtual machines. Um, if the load requires it, uh, or if the um, isolation that's required for your multi-tenancy requires it. Um, on the top left, the OpenShift command line tools uh, say you want to create a new application. Um, creating a new application involves uh, creating the Git repo, which will hold the code, uh, and uh, the indication of, of which sort of runtime you'll be using, whether um, it's Ruby, or even it's Perl, or it's PHP, or Red Hat is going through great lengths to make JBoss um, really a first-class citizen, um, and all of the um, all the great JBoss middleware that Red Hat's been working on for the past 10, 15 years available and deployable automatically in your enterprise. Um, the um, through these command line tools, there's also a web GUI. Um, I wish I could show you, but my VPN's not working. <laughs> um, so the, uh, the OpenShift API server and the build controller and the deployment controller are those parts that you would interact with the most as a developer, um, where uh, you check in new code, it will automatically build. Uh, you could switch it to build on a, on a cycle. You can um, bring in Jenkins hosts to do complete continuous integration. Uh, then um, the deployment uh, controller, once tests pass, can then go ahead and manage deployments of code over to the right side. Then below the line on the left um, in the Kubernetes master is all the scheduling in Kubernetes parts that um, manage um, the, the system's knowledge of where your containers are. Over on the right would be, in most cases, a separate or very many virtual machines running all of these containers. Um, there's the kubelet down on the lower left of this right side. The kubelet is the client for Kubernetes that is taking commands and sending information back to Kubernetes uh, in order to make intelligent decisions about the, um, the scalability requirements and the network configurations that are necessary in order to run all your Docker containers. Kubernetes organizes containers into, I gotta zoom in on this, into pods. One uh, one operating system or virtual machine running, um, running Kubernetes is called a minion. Um, 
Kubernetes breaks them down into, into pods that allows you to create associations, say, between a, uh, a web browser, uh, I'm sorry, a web server, a, an app server, and a database server. And you could have those three uh, containers all affiliated, associated with each other in a pod um, and replicate those pods across, uh, across minions. You would also have different types of pods for different types of workloads. Um, etcd, folks familiar with etcd? It's a, um, it's a highly, highly reliable um, key value store um, which provides Kubernetes uh, the overview of what's going on. So all of these are, are constantly checking in their data into the local etcd, and that information is being replicated throughout the cluster. Um, this is my plan and the, and the Red Hat recommended um, layout of virtual machines. Um, over on the left, we'd have a separate virtual machine or two, depending on your number of clients, a number of customers or, or tenants, um, to hold your code. And then you'd be checking in that code into, um, into OpenShift, where it would hit a Jenkins pipeline to ensure that it passes all the tests and it, and it compiles correctly. Um, then down on the lower left to app ex execution test uh, network and framework so the QA folks can go at it if you need to, if you haven't automated all of that. Um, all checking into the, into the center one, the Kubernetes registry of etcd. And then when you're ready to go production, when you're ready to deploy, it's just bringing those very same containers into production and perhaps doing a load balancer drain or something like that to allow you to run your, your uh, Java or Ruby applications off of databases that are also containerized. Um, but the big question is now, what is a tenant? If OpenShift has its own user space, its own, its own namespace of users, and OpenStack has its own namespace of users, where do we need to mesh them together? And this, this is the software project that we at Dell are also doing in the open to bring um, this fantastic paths into an infrastructure service um, and allow, say, a tenant to request more virtual machines uh, based on the activity within OpenShift. Um, the complexity starts growing very quickly um, as soon as you start getting a little creative. Um, the first points of integration are clearly neutron. Um, Configuring VLANs to keep the traffic separate between different containers is, is, is some heavy lifting. Um, OpenShift is built to talk to any sort of SDN product. It comes with a basic SDN product, which is really open vSwitch. Um, but the, the APIs that they've set up will allow really any S to, to call out to any SDN product to reconfigure the network. So integrating the, the Neutron uh, API into um, the OpenShift calls is, is what I'm working on right now. The, the next would be, there, I have some details about that. Our typical OpenStack networks, we have a provisioning network, a management network, a private uh, OpenStack API network, so Nova can talk to Nova and, and Keystone and everybody, uh, a typical storage network to get to your Ceph or your Swift or your Cinder volumes. Um, and then most importantly, highlighted there is your tenant networks. And you'll have more than one tenant network because you have many tenants and maybe they want back end, they want private networks between their virtual machines and then they want public floating IP or flat network spaces to be able to let their VMs get to the internet. But if you have multiple different tenants in OpenShift all working on the same VM because you can draw more, um, more value out of each processor that you're using by having several separate tenants, several different tenants on the same virtual machine, we have a real namespace issue here and a, and, a, and a networking issue here. OpenShift has a fairly simple network, um, just two basic networks, an orchestration network for Kubernetes to be able to do its work, um, and the load balancing access network, where um, there's always a load balancer involved with OpenShift, and uh, new client requests that hit the load balancer are then split off into a private network where, the, um, where all the requests are served. How those mesh together um, is, is really the challenge that we're starting to face now. Um, the auto-scaling requirements of would really force us to 
create and remove VLANs and ensure that our VLANs are being created uh, appropriately so our customers' traffic doesn't ride over each other. Um, the, I see this only as possible with VXLANs and more work in SE Linux and IP tables. And I'm working on that right now, and I'd love for you to join me. You can find me on the OpenShift mailing list. Um, other aspects of OpenShift that we are um, requiring uh, integration in order for this pass to really fully take off is the, is the identity problem. Um, within OpenShift, you have a variety of different types of identities. You have the overall administrator, you have project administrators, you have project users, and which ones of those are allowed to request more services from the various um, OpenStack services. Uh, the Nova scheduler, when will we be launching virtual machines? At what rate, based on what um, CPU availability on which nodes? Um, while there's, this is laid out and there's good quotas in OpenShift and there are good quotas in OpenStack, how are we going to merge those, uh, those two uh, sets of values together? I'm going to be, fortunately, I'm very glad this talk is early in the conference because I want to hear from you guys as I start planning all this out. Um, the third, well, the fourth after Neutron is, um, is heat, where when you know you have a customer coming in, if you're a large organization or you're a, uh, a service provider and you know a new department is coming on board and they're bringing a large application on board, you probably will have a bunch of heat templates to lay out all the networking and lay out all the storage and lay out all the, uh, all the virtual machines uh, instead of having to do it by hand. Um, the, um, the integration with that, um, with uh, OpenShift and ensuring that we can then get OpenShift installed um, on these virtual machines is key. Uh, that's all I got for now. Um, I've done a whole bunch of work behind, unfortunately, the Dell firewall, and everybody's probably suffering with the Wi-Fi here now, <laughs> trying to get to their own home networks. Um, I'm completely kicked off of mine. so. I'm really curious what questions or ideas folks have in order to begin integrating these. Thank you. There's a mic somewhere. Oh, there's a mic. Stand. So um, just for clarification, you are talking about containers on VMs, not containers yes. on bare metal. Not bare metal. OK. That, um, and, but you are then talking about Multiple multi-tenant VMs potentially. Yes. Okay, I understand that's a challenge. I'm not going <laughs> to ask anything else at this point. <laughs> um, and there are going to be a lot of talks also this week about Docker on bare metal, uh, OpenShift, uh, OpenStack running Docker containers. Um, but I think we lose a lot of the um, the operational efficiencies and the gifts that virtualization brought us. So can you please turn to page uh, 17, the previous page. So uh, why did you re replace uh, Sorry. page 17? Yeah. So why did you replace uh, uh, NOAA scheduler with Kubernetes? So what is the? No, no, no. I, I need the, the Kubernetes scheduler to be able to interact with a NOVA scheduler in, need, in order to launch virtual machines on demand. Not okay. replaced, okay. but have them integrated with each other. So as we look at. SDN software to define networks and on-demand network creation, integrating OpenShift and Kubernetes with Neutron, we need to also integrate OpenShift and Kubernetes with, with the Nova scheduler in order to request more resources. OK, so the Nova boot will still create VMs for Kubernetes manners or whatever. I'm sorry? So uh, the command of Nova boot will still create Kubernetes manners, right? Uh, Nova boot. I mean, uh, the command of no Nova Boot will create a VM. So the VM will be a Kubernetes manner or Kubernetes master. Um, also, depending on need. Right yeah. now, for uh, proof of concept, I would just not a Kubernetes master, but a Kubernetes minion oh, okay. would be the, uh, for, more, for more application. Yeah, let me uh, answer that as well. You're out of frame. I'll put you on the mic. All right, let me answer that as well. Um, the difference between the two is in, in OpenShift, when we talk about um, scaling up containers or these pods, right? Say you have a pod with a web server, two app runtimes, and, and a database, right? 
when we scale that up, we are um, not aware of the underlying infrastructure. And so when you run out of predefined Kubernetes minions, OpenShift by itself today cannot spin up these additional uh, minions because we don't have access to the underlying infrastructure. And so what Jed's talking about is integrating these two together so OpenShift can make a request with the correct authorization to spin up additional VMs inside of, of OpenStack and then lay down more Kubernetes minions to deploy the apps out and to scale it. Okay, thank you. So, uh, last question. So, did you use Heat to deploy the whole Kubernetes cluster? I'm sorry? Uh, did you use Heat? <laughs> To deploy the whole Kubernetes cluster. Did I use what? To do use heat. Heat. heat, heat, heat. No, yes. no, no, no. Okay, so uh. why not? <laughs> <laughs> and and then why not use that for your scale instead of manually doing it for those? Um, the uh, right now I'm in proof of concept, mm -hmm. and uh, heat. Um, sure, you could create a new heat manifest. And, and deploy that manifest again, uh, I'd be concerned with uh, overwriting existing virtual machines and, and getting networks wrong. But it's, uh, I'm not against using heat at all. But I, I prefer the, a much tighter integration between the two to get a, uh, the faster response. The scheduler, I'm, I'm relying on the Nova scheduler to understand what's going on on the gear much better than heat knows what's going on on the gear. Yeah, I don't want to start deploying, you know, 50 new virtual machines to a to a server that really only has a couple cycles to spare. Any other questions? I have one more. Cool. Um, what's the at this point um, Docker only? But what's the plans, and w when can we expect not to have a whole stack of Docker stuff that's not container specific? You know what I mean? Docker has a lot of things associated with it that you were mentioning. The marketplace, all that stuff that <laughs> most people just don't want. They want containers. You know, uh, at what point will something like Rocket be integrated? I don't know. That's, uh, that's the Red Hat guys. We're just Dell. <laughs> 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 yeah, so um, I can't actually ha give you a truthful answer right now simply because I don't know. Right. It's right. Yeah, I mean, you guys we are working towards actively, or yeah, we realize that you know people are going to want more container formats than just Docker, right? And so when we're releasing, we've we've spent seriously the last year and a half just getting the Docker stuff uh, brought up to where it needs to be to deploy it in the enterprise. And once we iterate on that, then we'll look at other containers. I guess one of my concerns with Docker is the same thing, same concerns Rocket has, right? It's creep and all this other stuff where you know you want a container, but I'm seeing three VMs of marketplace, blah 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 blah. All this infrastructure that you know you only need if you're going to basically drink the Docker Kool-Aid. Um, but if you just want you know containers, you know we've taken something like LXC and now wrapped so much stuff around it that you can't now use it by itself in a beautiful system that's something that's becoming a beautiful system is now encumbered by this massive yeah our, thing our plan is, is to fully support more things let, than, than yeah. docker but it, let me let me um, not selling any of the marketplaces or the docker hub um, the registry is really important even if you're only registering your own containers right. because that way you re you reduce sprawl and confusion about versioning containers yeah, and without a container versioning system mm -hmm. then you know yeah. yeah i mean most enterprises will not want to do a docker pull for, from docker hub they, well, for most they things. not want they can't legally right, right. everything else right there's a million reasons you don't put your stuff out in the outside world right and by doing that you're basically saying here's my image you manage it for me and 90 percent of the enterprises will say hell no yes yeah, right. so we're actually doing a lot of work around container certification and so if you're a red hat customer we will provide these for you so you can trust them and you call right. us for support and right. we're working on all you can use satellite cool. as well the, especially the I, I see the real value in the java um, middleware, where there's Java middleware everywhere, and finally can be reined in through containers and a really good registry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks a lot, everybody. And I'll be at like all the Docker talks. <laughs>